if you can print money and pay for a war, uh, then you don't need to go to your people and say, this is a war that's very important and we need to fight it. And it's important that we tax you so that you, we pay for the war and then have the populace of that nation respond and say, yes, we agree with you. This is an important war. We want to fight it. We can see why it's important and we are willing to pay taxes or buy war bonds or do something like that. You know, I make it a point in the book to say, like, you know, Bitcoin doesn't end wars. And certainly if there's a situation in which a country gets invaded or say, all right, well, we need to defend ourselves or we need to like this war is just we need to stop this bad person from taking over the, the you know, whatever. It's still possible to do that. You just need to like have a direct communication with your populace and who are willing to sacrifice either in taxes or go to war or, or whatever it is. Um, and Bitcoin provides an opportunity, at least in theory, for governments to be more accountable towards their people, uh, which I, you know, I just can't help but think that's that's the good thing, right? Like that's an improvement over what we have now. That's the key. Like my goal is to just make people comfortable learning about Bitcoin. And, it, and my book is not for everybody. Like it's certainly like like it speaks about Bitcoin from an angle that some people aren't going to agree with. Um, but I, I do think everybody who cares about Bitcoin has somebody in their life that this book will speak to. So I think that's the hope is, like you say, the knock on effect. Like if you give the book to somebody, then they might learn about Bitcoin and be excited about it and then give the book to somebody else. And that's the hope, right? That in five years from now, like uh, there's there's a community out there who understands Bitcoin from this angle and it really speaks to them. Hey, Jason, how's it going? Very good. Very good. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. No, I'm really I'm really looking forward to it as well. And um, yeah, I appreciate you coming on. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, a great place to kind of start is like, tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, I know you're a teacher and I know you've got this kind of this book as well. And yeah. so talk to me a little bit about that and I guess sort of your your path to path to where you are. Yeah. So uh, my day job is that I'm a high school math teacher. I teach uh, grades nine through 12 uh, here in the uh, in the U.S. Um, it was always sort of my childhood dream to be a math teacher. Uh, so sort of. Uh, Happily got that. I love my job. Um, and uh, I recently wrote a, a Bitcoin book. So I got into Bitcoin, uh, you know, a few years ago and realized that uh, the resources that I really wanted to see out there uh, didn't exist or it was harder for me to find them. So I decided to write a progressive case for Bitcoin that talks about uh, sort of the value proposition of Bitcoin through, uh, you know, the the progressive lens. Um, and, you know, that's been all kind of a wild journey. I have never written a book before this. So it was just sort of a moment where I said, hey, the book that I want doesn't exist. So let me, um, you know, let me try to write it. So uh, that book just got released last month. And it has been sort of a wild ride since then, you know, it's, it's actually pretty much a month since it got released. So mm. It's interesting because you kind of, as you say, there was no resource in this area, which is why I find like you're really interesting along with people like Margot and that kind of thing, because mm -hmm. you kind of, you came slash like, like are coming into Bitcoin from like a different angle, which like I feel has been fairly unexplored. And when you kind of like look at the larger demographics, say outside of Bitcoin, like everyone assumes like money, capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like. There's this whole like connotation. So yeah. I find it fascinating. Yeah. I mean, what was it? Yeah. What kind of drew you into that? Like, what was it that like made you kind of almost stand out from the other people who maybe ignored it for X reasons or thinking it's kind of, oh, it's like really capitalist, blah, blah, blah all this sort of stuff. Um, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question because I, um, you know, I originally got into Bitcoin sort of from a mathematical like lens, right? Like I'm a math teacher. I'm into computer science. Um, a buddy of mine suggested that I invest in a Bitcoin or at least look into it. So the, you know, my goal was to learn as much as I could from sort of just like, how does a technology work standpoint? Um, and I, you know, through that lens, I got a conviction for it. So like I, like I believed in Bitcoin or I understood it and I was excited about it from the very beginning through this mathematical lens and, um, and a little bit of computer science, like I'm an amateur, like hobby coder too. Um, and so I had that conviction. And then I realized that um, as I as I tried to go deeper down the rabbit hole, I was getting a lot of political stuff that I didn't necessarily agree with. And 
um, you know, my impetus to write the book wasn't necessarily like, oh, I'm a progressive person and I'm offended by these people that I see online or like on Twitter or on YouTube talking about Bitcoin. It was more um, as an educator, as a person whose job it is to teach um, you know, day in and day out, I'm teaching kids uh, mathematics that is complicated and scary and, and difficult to learn. So I knew that people that I cared about, the progressives and the liberals that are in my life, um, would not want to learn in an environment where they didn't feel comfortable. So um, all of those political messages that you hear, like the libertarian and the conservative bent towards Bitcoin, which is um, often on social media or a lot of the resources that you find is dismissive towards sort of the concerns that progressive people really care about, wasn't necessarily going to be a good learning environment. So uh, that was the impetus to write the book. Now, uh, when I did that, um, I never heard of Margot Paez. Like she, you know, Margot has been great and a super important ally in the space and, and for me. Uh, but she hadn't gone on any podcast at that point uh, or, you know, nobody really, she wasn't had a name in the space uh, when I decided to write the book. The same with like Troy Cross or uh, any of these other people. And so the, you know, when I decided to write the book, it was sort of like, it almost felt like I was alone sort of in the sea and like, okay, what can I do to, to help build a resource? And of course, since then, uh, more people have come out of the woodwork. We mentioned a couple already, but um, there's actually sort of a thriving community out there that I didn't really know about. And you have to search to find. And hopefully by providing the book as a resource, more people will be able to come into the space find the people that align with them politically, um, if that's something they care about, or at least learn about Bitcoin in a way that doesn't uh, turn them off or call them names or, or sort of dismiss the things that they care about. Because those things aren't necessarily important to Bitcoin. Uh, just learning about Bitcoin and understanding how important it is and how useful it is, is probably the most important thing. And we can put aside sort of those political differences, or at least make sure that people are comfortable learning within the space. So. Uh -huh. It's interesting what you say about the learning environment, because I've also taught maths and physics as like a tutor. And you do yeah. like there is that initial friction. You have to make someone feel really comfortable, like it's a safe space that like you're not going to be judged for asking questions. Like if you think you're going to be judged for asking questions, like your learning is stopped, basically. Yeah. And so then kind of your idea to try and create that. But then for Bitcoin, um, which once again, yeah, as you say, like especially on Twitter can get seriously like that, like. You've got like different layers of cultiness and then just like general, like this is interesting. And so right. then like you can misinterpret certain signals when you're kind of coming in from the outside. So I yeah. really like that idea. Yeah. And and certainly I think that that's the, the number one like priority for me is is to just make, you know, like I'm not like in terms of a political sense, like I'm kind of a pleb, right? Like I'm just a normal person out there who votes and who cares about certain things. Um, and I just knew that um, that the messages people would hear would probably turn them off if that's sort of their first touch on Bitcoin when they're taking it seriously. Um, and and ultimately, you know, I, I think that it's more important for me to to convince somebody that they're wrong or about Bitcoin or that they should take it seriously than it is to convince them that they're wrong about some other political topic. Like, oh, you're wrong about climate change and I'm going to call you names and make you feel stupid about it. it. That's not, that shouldn't be the first tack. It's not going to actually reach anybody. It's just going to uh. turn them off and, and uh, limit adoption or, or delay it. So that was my, that was my thinking behind writing the book. Uh. I also like the idea that you had no idea like of all these other people because like there's the argument sometimes that like for originality or to like to comfortably almost be yourself like being alone like helps that like the less almost like external noise then you it almost it's just like what you think really because you're like oh i disagree with the guys this is just what i think there's no and and at what point kind of like writing the book like was it only like at what point during like writing the book like maybe being on twitter you're like oh there's actually all these other people and then you can actually sort of bounce these ideas off them yeah no i mean it's been sort of a journey and, and i think that process continues to this day right like by the time 
Um, you know, I got the idea for the book and sort of, like I said, I didn't really know of anybody else in the space um, who sort of felt the same way that I did about Bitcoin and politics. Um, but you, you start to pick up on it, right? Like there's a, I hear a podcast interview with somebody like Margot Paez and I say, okay, well, this is somebody that now is on my radar. Or at some point uh, while I was writing the book, um, I got, you know, that's when Alex Gladstein released his book, um, you know, uh, Check Your Financial Privilege. So all of a sudden you start to get these, um, these other messages that support uh, what you're doing. I mean, there's an interesting story that I relay in the book, which is, um, you know, I'd almost given up on the idea of writing the book completely. And uh, I was sort of losing steam and wasn't really feeling inspired or I felt like people weren't going to really pay attention to it. So I, I almost gave up on it. And then I found this community of um, black Bitcoiners who are out there educating the black community in America about Bitcoin and how it's a it's a financial tool for everybody. And um, like that, all of a sudden I got this new inspiration to say, hey, there here's yet again another uh, population of people who I didn't even know existed, but are really motivated and interested in Bitcoin. And so that seeing that community and seeing other communities sort of pop up like it has been an inspiration throughout. And now uh, there's no doubt that like the the community, at least online, of progressive Bitcoiners is larger than I thought it was. I, I think I know everybody, but you never you never know. Like it's it's growing all the time, and um, I've I've come. You know, people have reached out to me and say, "Hey, I've been in this space for you know ten years, and I've always been a progressive liberal person, and I've always felt alone." So thank you for what you're doing. That's just my hope is that the book provides a resource for people out there who want to um, um, better understand the arguments or to orange pill. A friend or family member who they don't agree with politically. So even if you're a conservative and you just somebody in your life that you care about, you want them to understand Bitcoin. Like this would be a good resource for it. Hmm. I haven't actually. I'm guilty of saying I haven't managed to get around to reading your book yet. Yeah. So I would love to hear what was kind of like you say you give this as like a way to, as you say, help orange pull someone to get them through the basics so they understand mm -hmm. it. Yeah. What was kind of your your core angle that you went about actually kind of breaking it down in a way that someone can understand it? Like what sort of structure did you decide to follow? Yeah. So the book is sort of split up into chapters. And, and for the most part, those chapters are all going to speak to like one sort of core progressive ideal that somebody would care about. And then sort of what is the problem that exists in the in the legacy financial system and and better understanding that and then sort of what is Bitcoin's response to it. Um, so. Um, you know, what I found is the more people learn about Bitcoin, like you can't learn a lot about Bitcoin without learning more about the legacy financial system. Uh, and it's super important. It's almost as important as Bitcoin is learning how our system currently works. So like there's a chapter about, um, you know, essentially like Bitcoin versus big banks and really understanding that, you know, Bitcoin can be seen as a protest against big banks and the relationship between big banks and, and government and that that's not helpful for like ordinary everyday people. Um, and how does that speak to a progressive ideal and um, values that uh, liberals and progressives have? And how does Bitcoin really address that? How does Bitcoin offer an alternative system that doesn't rely on these trusted third parties or uh, governments telling banks what to do or banks deciding what to do in ways that are unfair? Um, so like that would be one example of a chapter say, all right, here's what the mm -hmm. legacy financial system does and here's what Bitcoin offers in support. Um, I start the book by saying, like, why did I write the book is like chapter one, like why this book? Because I do think it's in, it's important to contextualize in this moment in time. Um, if you're not careful, like Bitcoin can seem really partisan and uh, there's a lot of sort of like strong libertarian and, and conservative ideals uh, sort of floating around in, in the community. Um, and, and this book has a place in that conversation. Chapter two is why Bitcoin. So like, why is it that, how does Bitcoin work and why uh, do uh. the properties that uh, flow out of that design choice mean that it's good for progressive ideals? So like your own understanding coming at it just from being maths. Yeah, yeah. So I tried to try to explain it sort of to a beginner, like how does it work? And then how do the ways that it works give these properties like censorship resistant? Uh, it, there's no barriers to entry. Anybody can use it. Um, like, how does that 
like how does that design choice of what Bitcoin is imply those things? And then how do those things imply helping a progressive, um, you know, uh, agenda? So. Hmm. I think the problem is definitely, yeah. I mean, this is, it's almost like the most difficult one as well, because there's so many layers <laughs> of the problem. Like how deep do you go other than just like inflation and yeah, like banks can like close down. But it's definitely yeah. like the more like that it's these are the kind of things that no one thinks about, right? Like the the simple problems with your bank, especially with like us in the West. And you've got to be like, no, there's guys out there who've like just get the bank accounts closed because of X, Y, Z, like or like because they disagree with like certain X, Y, Z thing. And then you sort of dig in there like, oh, my God, like, really? And like, yeah, you're like, oh, they've got like 50, 100 percent inflation. <laughs> and then when yeah, you yeah. all those things and then you're looking for a solution and then you present something. It's, yeah, such a warmer reaction to then something which might then fix it. Right. And and I think that, you know, the like a lot of people um, that I talk to aren't necessarily like against Bitcoin. They just don't understand it or they haven't thought deeply about it. And they certainly haven't thought deeply about the legacy financial system. So when you present these things as, all right, there's problems that exist out there in the world. Like you might not experience them as an American or a European, but like other, most other people in the world have to deal with these problems. Like runaway inflation, not having a bank, like not trusting your government to debase the money supply, not having to like trust your government to like not seize your funds or freeze your funds. Uh, like there's a lot of things out there that are actually problematic with the legacy financial system and Bitcoin offers an alternative. Um, the other thing that is is kind of interesting is that the, you know, the progressive audience, if they've heard anything about Bitcoin at all, um, usually it, it stems around FUD that makes Bitcoin look bad, right? So you have a lot of fear and, uh, you know, misunderstandings and doubt going on about, um, like, uh, about what Bitcoin is. So like the book that I wrote is in part to try to address some of those things. So like, if you're just a sort of a low information liberal voter, uh, and you say, oh, well, the only thing I've heard about Bitcoin is that it's bad for the environment. Like I speak to that in the book because I think that's probably one of the most important things that um, mm. people have, you know, sort of levied against Bitcoin as um, as a reason why it's harmful. So like the the environmental chapter, the chapter about the environment in my book is the longest chapter because it's probably the most important right now in this moment. Um, mm. And hopefully that gives people an opportunity to think about like the environmental impact of Bitcoin in the context of the good that it does but also in a more nuanced way, right? Um, and so I think that's critical for people really understanding sort of the overall picture of how Bitcoin interacts with the environment, but also just sort of like all of these political things that are popping up, uh, like where's Bitcoin's place in that conversation? Uh, I mean, the environment is probably the, I mean, it's almost, it feels ridiculous that it still is. Like I end up kind of talking about it on most chats lists to an extent, but yeah. it's like, no, like whenever you sit down and think about it, like to a decent logic, like I find like I was speaking to a um, really big marketer. He's like super anti-crypto, pretty anti-Bitcoin, all this kind of thing. And we're just having yeah. a chat about it because um, he used to be, he was in crypto before, um, but kind of more was like leading marketing things. And he was like, oh my God, it's like terrible because he was obviously saw all the scams or shit coins, all this kind of thing. Yeah. And then when we came onto the topic of the environment, I kind of like tried to lay everything out really simply, explain it all. And he was like, makes sense i have yeah. i have nothing to say against it yeah, so you yeah. have that and like there is like tr like if if fair, it feels logical but then despite that it is still probably the largest attack vector like when i speak to anyone who's not into it they're like oh my god like i saw on instagram like pictures of like all these mining computers just for mining bitcoin like it's so terrible like x coal yeah. mines being brought back on and um, yeah it's it's a, it's a tricky topic well, yeah, and I, I think it's easy for a politician or sort of a liberal thought leader to just say, all right, well, I'm going to levy this criticism of Bitcoin and then know that it's going to be like an emotional reaction by people. Mm. Right? Like it's it's playing off of people's like sort of in gut instincts to say, I know something that's bad for the environment is bad, so I don't need to really think deeply about it. Like I'm being told this information and, and I believe it. So the the key to success there is to understand like somebody's having an emotional reaction they're not thinking through it logically and then to try to guide them like you were saying like let's think about this in a more subtle way like we can't sort of proceed with this um assumption that like 
any energy use is bad. And therefore, mm-hmm. if something uses energy, it is bad. Like we need to think about it in a more nuanced way. So, um, you know, I, the very first thing I do is try to articulate, well, there's, there's use here, there's value in using Bitcoin. So first of all, like its energy use is important because it provides these important things. And it also has um, sort of surprising, if you haven't thought about it, implications about grid stability and building out um, renewables and mitigating methane and, you know, all of the things that Bitcoiners probably know a lot about at this point, because it's been a, a huge topic of conversation. But people who are new to the space probably don't know a lot about that or about the idea that like electricity generation and distribution and use is is very complicated compared to what most people think, right? They just turn their lights on and it works. Um, And the idea that we might need like a, uh, like a large scalable instantaneously like responsive base load uh, with Bitcoin miners to actually balance the grid and allow for renewables and things like that is not something that's not how people think about it. So we have to sort of train them into thinking more nuanced. Um, and so the book attempts to do that. And when I have conversations in, in real life with people, like that's what I'm trying to do is say, it's actually the picture is more complicated than you think. Mm. Yeah, I think the idea that you need the grid is better off if you have something that uses energy, like if you have like bringing in a new thing that uses the energy at specific times, that that helps like overall grid generation, I think super, super alien thought because unless you kind of do like study engineering or kind of dip into that or have any sort of interest in it, you kind of just think, yeah, electricity just comes with power plant. Like I switch it on and I start using it and maybe I switch it off (laughs) and I stop and it's like, no. And then when you kind of go into like the methane mitigation aspects, Mm -hmm. especially with kind of, yeah, all these landfill sites, um, Mm -hmm. I was kind of, yeah, digging into Daniel Batten a bit with this. And like, I didn't yeah. realize that it was, it's like the breaking down of it in the absence of, without oxygen is what actually causes a lot of these problems. And, right. and so like with, if it was naturally, if it did have the oxygen, you would kind of, you wouldn't get methane. You would kind of just get CO2 and you'd kind of skip that aspect. But because we've created these environments, we have massive pools of methane now. Yeah. And so... And there's no, there's no, there's no way to really get rid of that. Um, and there's no financial. Well, there is, but there's no financial incentive. Right, and and I think that's the that's one of the key points is that like there's regulations. At least I know there are in the in the U.S. to say, all right, well, if you operate a landfill, here's how you have to treat the methane and how you have to process it so it doesn't harm the environment. Um, but there, like, it's essentially like a stick approach, right? Like, we're going to penalize you if you don't do this stuff. And it's really hard to enforce. Like, the, the agency that's designed to enforce these rules, like, is spread way too thin. So most landfill operators decide not to do those mitigating efforts because, like you say, there's no financial incentive to do it other than the potential of getting caught. And it's just cheaper to actually just pay the fine. So ultimately it's not good for the environment. They're just like letting the methane out into the atmosphere because you know there's a good chance they're not gonna get caught. And even if they do, it's still cheaper than building out the infrastructure to do it. And Bitcoin changes that equation. Instead of saying, we're gonna penalize you if you don't, it says, we're gonna reward you if, if you do. We're gonna actually help you mine Bitcoin, make money, um, incentivize the build out of this infrastructure and monetize it. And so um, you get instantaneous buy-in from people who are in this position because instead of like just trying to avoid getting punished, they're doing the right thing and actually getting rewarded. And that um, yeah. that's only possible with Bitcoin because it's location agnostic. It's like a flexible load and it can just plop down anywhere. You know, there's limitations by just physics, but like you can essentially go anywhere and use that stranded energy. And it's not like it's a non-rival user of energy compared to like households and hospitals and orphanages. Like we're not stealing electricity from people. We're actually using electricity that would have been wasted otherwise. Um, so like a lot of people are surprised to learn all of that, right? Like it's not mm. something that you think about. It doesn't, that kind of stuff doesn't show up in, um, in the media or people that you usually talk it. about it. Hmm. Yeah. I want to kind of come like, this is obviously one major trident of kind of, the progressive case for Bitcoin. But I wonder like, what are like, if you were to describe like the other points of a trident, like what were your, your kind of your key, your key kind of high level points. And then maybe we can dig into a few from there. 
Sure. Um, I think I think one of the other most compelling ideas that I talk about in the book is essentially that um, having um, a monetary system that's a global monetary system, but it's controlled by essentially one country, and, and it has been for a while, um, is is inherently an unfair system and try to outline the ways in which sort of the United States as a country um, who controls the world's reserve currency has benefited from that in unfair ways. Um, and not just benefited, but also like suppressed other nations and, and kept them from growing uh, with their natural resources and all of the their labor and efforts um, has sort of suppressed other countries to the benefit of um, like countries in the West. And I think that, you know, Bitcoin offers an, a, like just a different viewpoint, a lens through looking at that that says, you know, you know, before Bitcoin, you might say, well, all right, some country has to be in control of the money and it's better that it's the United States and some other country and kind of maybe you talk yeah. your way through it. But now we have an option that says there's a there's a perfectly viable monetary system that exists um, that um, transcends global you know, geopolitics. No one country is in charge of it. No one country has an advantage. And all countries and all people within those countries are competing on a level playing field. Like that completely changes the equation and is a is a much different uh -huh. um, thought experiment. So the idea of this like sort of inherent unfairness in the global like sort of economic system and Bitcoin being a response is one of the other main points in the book. Um, you know, I talk about uh, wealth inequality and wealth concentration as something that progressives care a lot about and, and the ways in which our current financial system and our legacy financial system um, uh, add to that in ways that most liberal politicians don't acknowledge or, or understand. Um, I talk about the idea of printing money to fund wars and how, you know, most progressive people and liberals uh. don't like war um, and they don't really understand how it's paid for and how the way in which we pay for wars makes them more likely to happen. And if we change that, then uh, it would be uh, make the world a more peaceful place. So there's a lot of different avenues that I sort of, um, you know, paths that I go down within the book and, and within explaining. And what's interesting about that is that it's, it's really just a compilation of things that have resonated with people. Sometimes I talk about the environmental piece and it doesn't, um, people don't, you know, respond to it well. So like, all right, well, now maybe I talk about like financial freedom and inclusion for people in the global South who don't have banks and mm -hmm. like that, maybe that's the thing that resonates with them. Or I talk about, you know, this, um, the hegemony of the US dollar and how that's unfair and maybe that resonates with them. So everybody has something that will, you know, presumably there's something wrong with the current system that will resonate with somebody and you have to find that. And so I just try to compile those and, and explain them as thoroughly as I can uh, within the book. So that was the, so those are the sort of the main points. And then like the idea that the whole book is just sort of like, a, like the best of collection of arguments that have resonated with different people in my, in my journeys. Mm. I want to go into the, the relationship, I guess, between our money and war. Because I think the idea mm -hmm. that a theoretical system that, say, where you couldn't print your money and say it was something more Bitcoin-based would mitigate mm -hmm. wars is mm -hmm. definitely not something that most people would ever even think of. And definitely initially you hear it, you're like, what? And yeah. so tell me a little bit more about that and how you go about kind of talking about it. So, um, yeah, I mean, and again, like, I think you're right. Most people probably have never thought about this. Um, and, and most people, when you ask them, they say, oh, I don't like war. Uh, but they don't think about sort of how, um, you know, how wars are funded or how they get approved or, you know, anything like that. So I think I start by talking, um, actually, like I, I provide like a backdrop of World War One, And I explain that um, when World War One started, uh, in the years before World War I, like pretty much every country was on a gold standard, which limited their ability to print money and was mm. sort of like a tether to like a real world scarce commodity that couldn't just be produced like um, like printing money is. So every country had a, a gold standard that limited them in some way. And then I talk about like, well, okay, France is under threat of being invaded and like there's this thing building up and, um, you know, in, in Europe and this, this war sort of starts to consume 
all of Europe in World War One, and um, and the and France declares war on Germany, and Germany declares war on France. And uh, how long does it take for France to discard the gold standard and say we're not doing that for now? We're just going to print money. Um, and the answer is two days. It take, you know, between the declaration of war and the the dropping of the gold standard is it takes two days. And wow. France wasn't the only country. Every single country that participated in the war dropped the gold standard. And their ability to sort of like print money to pay for munitions, to pay for food for soldiers and boots and guns and bullets and all of that stuff and tanks. Um, really stem from printing money in a way that allowed each government to conduct a war and pay for it and feed their soldiers and transport them and, and kill the other side um, in a way that's completely detached from sort of the public um, investment in that. So, which is to say, if you can print money and pay for a war, uh, then you don't need to go to your people and say, this is a war that's very important and we need to fight it. And it's important that we tax you so that you, we pay for the war. And then have the populace of that nation respond and say, yes, we agree with you. This is an important war. We want to fight it. We can see why it's important and we are willing to pay taxes or buy war bonds or do something like that. It allows this sort of layer of obfuscation between the people who are doing the fighting and the sacrificing the people who are making the decisions. Um, and then sort of if you if you extend that out, we can see that um, it's just gotten worse, right? Like we, you know, we've been fighting two wars um, in America for like, you know, most of my adult life. Um, and both, you know, we just recently pulled out of Afghanistan. But like for the most part, like since I was in college, we've been in both Iraq and, and Afghanistan and have lost, you know, lots of blood and treasure in those conflicts none of which were popular um, and mm -hmm. all of and none are, like, you know, maybe at the beginning, but nobody likes those wars and saying, um, well, how is it that like we can fight a 20 year war that's not popular? Well, the American people weren't asked to sacrifice anything. We didn't have higher taxes. We weren't given war bonds. We weren't given like a, a voice, like there was no declaration of war. Um, and the reason is we were just able to print money and go into debt to service those wars. And there was no accountability for the politicians making those decisions to start a war and the people who had to pay for it. Like the American people weren't asked to sacrifice at all to go to this war. And even though um, the war was unpopular, there was no sort of outcry. If the people had to pay taxes and say, hey, we agree with this war, we'll pay your taxes, then that would be a different story. But that's certainly the United States government in this case was totally able to sidestep that entire process, print money, make huge, like these huge devastating wars that killed tons of people and cost a lot of money without ever having to, to sort of directly go to the people and ask for it because they had this source of, of new, freshly printed money. And so the idea that... Um, to really think, pull back the layer on how are wars funded? How is violence and conflict funded? Who benefits from that? Who pays the price for that? And then what kind of um, what kind of effect would it have if we had a system where you couldn't just print money? You had to actually, um, you know, use scarce, valuable resources and trade those in for guns and tanks and, and airplanes and things like that. Um, how would that affect it? And I think that the claim in the book is that you would have a much more direct relationship between the the people making the decisions and the people doing the fighting if there was that sort of like link to a real world, real life scarce commodity asset uh, like Bitcoin, or of course in the in the past we had gold. Um, and, and the difference is you can't just suspend a Bitcoin standard if you had one, like you can a gold standard because uh, it's easy for individuals to to hold on to their Bitcoin and to store it themselves. They don't need like, you know, gold is heavy and complicated uh -huh. and, and hard to custody. Um, and so it's just a way for, for regular people to hold their governments accountable. Um, and that includes war and, and a lot of other things that um, governments spend money on. And I think that's probably good to have more um, transparency, more efficiency, more communication and more accountability uh, in the government. Uh -huh. I mean, you're kind of not completely removing a vote, but like you're, you're removing the skin in the game in a sense. Like when you put your own money, when you know that there's only so much money available, so the government has to come to the people if they want to fight a war. And then mm -hmm. the people almost decide like how many tanks, how many things can you fund? 
with their wallet. And then once you do that, the government obviously has to basically update the people being like, because the, pe the people are going to care now, right? They've put their money towards this thing. They've like, they're maybe going to have to cut down on whatever it is they were going to buy, X, Y, Z. And so the government is then obligated. Whereas in this kind of the way we have it now, you don't, you, you don't need to talk to the public at all. You just need to say, oh, we're going kind of thing. Yeah. Like, this is something we're doing. You don't need anything from them. And then you don't really need to even update them because they don't even care so much because they're just living their own lives because they've got no skin in the game anymore. Yeah. And, and, and of course, the results are devastating, right? There's, there's uh, millions of people have died over the last uh, 20 or 30 years because of these policies. And, and like you said, there's no accountability. So there's no direct link to um, from the politicians to say, um, this is why this war is a priority. Of course, um, I make it the point, to, you know, I make it a point in the book to say, like, you know, Bitcoin doesn't end wars. And certainly if there's a situation in which a country gets invaded or say, all right, well, we need to defend ourselves or we need to like this war is just we need to stop this bad person from taking over the, the you know, whatever. It's still possible to do that. You just need to like have a direct communication with your populace and who are willing to sacrifice either in taxes or go to war or, or whatever it is. Um, and Bitcoin provides an opportunity, at least in theory, for governments to be more accountable towards their people, uh, which I, you know, I just can't help but think that's that's the good thing. Right. Like that's an improvement over what we have now. Mm. And the other kind of the knock on effect as well is when you sort of when the government can do this, like sort of bypass needing to take money from the public is that there's still a cost. Right. But it's a yeah. cost to the people later down the line in the form of inflation. So like after after both world wars. All mm -hmm. countries experienced major inflation. Everyone lost their savings. Any hard-earned savings you did have, which were held in cash at a bank, completely like, like halved. Um, and and that's right. not something really people really think about either. Like the fact mm -hmm. that the government can do this, like your savings account, is probably it's suffering a little bit. Like not only do interest rates maybe have to be kept lower than they should be because there's so much debt in the system, they're right. also printing more money, which is causing more inflation. And so right. it's kind of this, like, this knock on the hidden tax. So you are, you're still paying for it, but it's like the future you without you even realizing it. Right. And, that, and that's why politicians do it, right? Because it's a way to get what they want without um, people realizing that they're they're getting taken from, right? Or, you know, I think it's just a, it's just a more noble thing to say, hey, this is a priority for us, whatever it is, like war, uh, schooling, healthcare, whatever the priority is, like this is what the priority is and this is what your taxes are going for as opposed to going into debt. And we know like, well, if we go into debt, we need inflation, we need low interest rates, we need those things to happen. Otherwise, the system collapses in itself. Um, it's just sort of a sneaky way to get what you want. And um, obviously, we know politicians are incentivized to go down that sneaky road. Um, but it's it, it'd be much better to take away that the ability to do that, right? Like just to be more transparent. Uh, and of course, you know, the you know, one of the worst cases of hyperinflation ever happened in Germany after World War One, right? Like this, this is like a real thing. Like it, uh, it's not so bad in, in some countries, but in other countries, it's devastating. And it actually like sort of, you know, they they say World War One was the war to end all wars, and like the direct consequence of World War One, like led the dominoes to World War Two, you know, mm -hmm. like this is like the hyperinflation and the collapsing of the German economy sort of like has pretty direct ties into what happened in the lead up to World War Two. So, you know, those those hidden costs that are down the line and to your future self actually like are really important. Um, and so we're thinking about and most people don't. Uh, yeah, definitely. Because all the I mean, to, to oversimplify it to an extent, like the hardship created by the kind of the amount of money that Germany owed and the amount of inflation they were experiencing allowed an environment for an extremist sort of opinion to slowly start to rise who can point a finger at someone and blame. And so then like, it's almost like chaos is a ladder, right? And so you have all this chaos and people then get more and more polarized. And so then in that, in that environment, like someone can Hitler, can rise up because mm -hmm. like extreme extreme environments create extreme decisions and and so it that maybe becomes normal to sort of point a finger at something or like oh it's like it's because of xyz yeah. and and then yeah we all we all know what happened after that hmm.
Yeah. And, you know, so the hope and, and again, like that, that's just one sort of chapter in, in the book, right? Like I, I tr- sort of outline throughout like, hey, like if you're a progressive person, you know that there's things wrong with the current system. Like you feel that it's not fair, that um, that it benefits certain people, that the system itself is opaque and difficult to understand. And it feels like there's a reason for that because they don't want you to understand it. So I think that really the, the theme throughout the book is like, you're gonna learn about Bitcoin and you're gonna learn a little bit more about how our current financial system works. And the more people learn about Bitcoin, the more they like it. And the more people learn about the current financial system, the more they dislike it. Um, and just sort of laying that out there. So like war is an example, like inflation is an example, wealth inequality is an example, um, the environment is an example. Uh, you know, so these are just sort of like, sort of, um, you said like points on a trident, but you know, there's 10 chapters in the book and they all like, they all have a special trident. Piece of my heart. <laughs> <Ten> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I want to touch on um, briefly, you mentioned kind of we get this feeling that things are not right, that mm-hmm. things are slightly unfair, that you're kind of you're you're like everyone. It seems like everyone's working harder and you maybe don't have as much to show for it. And so touch on a little bit about, I guess, kind of your chapter on wealth inequality mm-hmm. and how the kind of the current system sort of drives that. Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, wealth inequality uh, and wealth concentration are both like sort of hugely important topics within the world of like in, in the U.S. Democratic voters, people on the left side of the political spectrum. It's something they care about a lot. And, and you know, I count myself among those that group of people. Right. Like this is, you know, it, it feels like the system is broken in the sense that like there's a very few people who can benefit uh, to like a gross extent. Um, and then everybody else is struggling, right? Like we can see that, um, you know, in particular, like wages don't keep up with inflation. And if you work like a, you know, nine to five job and, and you're just sort of a laborer, and then you're going to be struggling to get by. Whereas there's a handful of people in the world who have like pretty much more resources, more money, more assets than they possibly could ever use in a hundred lifetimes. That doesn't feel right. And I think that that's sort of like the the start. And a lot of progressive people um, just sort of listen to the politicians say, okay, well, this is true. Like this is a problem and here's how we're going to solve it. And I think what Bitcoin allows you to do is maybe just dive a little bit deeper into understanding the root cause of the problem, um, at least in conjunction with some of the other things that you might already believe. So it's very infrequent that you're going to get a politician citing like wealth inequality. And then also like, this is how money is created. And the, and the very creation of that money is inherently unfair and advantages some people. So I talk in the book about the Cantillon effect and how people who are close to this sort of spigot of money who say, all right, I have an advantage position because I work for a bank or I own a bank or I have a relationship with a large bank that has a relationship with the Federal Reserve, like those people inherently get first access to newly printed money. They can buy um, scarce hard assets with that newly printed money. And then the rest of that money get trickles through the economy in a way that causes inflation. And the people who get that money last, who are just sort of by definition furthest from the spigot, they are the poorest, the most disadvantaged, the most vulnerable people in society end up getting newly printed money that is worth less because it's been debased. Uh So I think that understanding that at least part of like wealth inequality and the fact that certain people are like billions of times more wealthy than other people, like that has to be part of the understanding, right? And the fact that it increased uh, more rapidly during COVID when there's a whole new fresh round of money printing is just sort of goes to show you like, oh, well, like the richest people in the world got much richer during the pandemic. And that's probably Usually. not, you know, that's not the intention of like printing stimulus checks or having new government policies that makes like an easy monetary policy. But that was the effect, even if it wasn't the intention. And we have to understand that like easy money and money printing and money creation does not sort of flow through the economy in an equal way. It advantages people. So, you know, obviously the answer in my mind is, all right, well, you have Bitcoin, which is 
um, not equal, um, but certainly more fair system. And like, there's nobody who just because of their position at the Federal Reserve has access to newly, fr- you know, freshly printed money. Or uh, if you're close to the government and you have information, or you you know people, or you well connected, you're going to have a better time uh, making use of that newly printed money compared to somebody else. So I offer Bitcoin as an alternative to that system. That's just the incentives are inherently unfair and you're not going to find a way to, to fix it with the old system. You need something new. Um, so I offer Bitcoin as, as an alternative um, in that argument. Hmm. It's funny that you say it's equal, but not fair. Cause I oh know, sorry, it's fair, but not equal because so many people are like, Oh, isn't like Bitcoin just for like making like everyone got in early, like really rich, like it's just billionaires. And it's yeah. like, they, they took a certain risk and they will get a certain payoff. But fundamentally, like the, the, the playing ground is even in terms of there's no outright benefit to having loads. Um, you, you're yeah. Not, yeah, you're, you're still like if you have one Bitcoin versus someone has a hundred, like you're still getting you're not getting huge knock on unfairness, I guess, in a sense. And where we have now where because it's like it's the same medium, right? Whereas where we are now, it's like one person's holding cash. One person's got loads of property and investments in like the stock market, for example. Whereas if you're in Bitcoin, like everyone's realistically you're just probably going to hold it <laughs> with to a sense that like you still have stocks in a sense, but it'll be because yeah. you want to invest in a company, not to just escape this inflation, which most people right. never end up escaping. Yeah. And, and I think that's hugely important, right? Like what we have right now is a lot of people in the U.S. and, and lots of other countries too, like Canada, I know some statistics on also. Uh, who can't afford houses because we put a monetary premium on homes, right? Like we we can't keep cash because we know that it inflates away. So we have to put our money somewhere. And we've, and we've essentially put a monetary premium on like a home, which uh, means that like, well, now homes cost more because that's our store of value. We're going to store mm-hmm. our value in our homes. And the only reason we're doing that is because our money is broken, right? And so th- who does this help? It helps people who already own homes, but it doesn't help people who are starting out and just want to get by or like, you know, own their own property or own their own house. Like it just puts those things out of like reach for them. So like this idea that the money is broken and therefore we have to do like, we have to invest in the stock market or we have to buy property in order just to retain the purchase well. power. Yeah. I mean, that that's like, that just an, is an indication that the money is broken. Like people shouldn't have to be a, a, an amateur or pro investor just to retain their purchasing power. You shouldn't have to like, be good at investing in the stock market just so that you don't lose money. You should be able to like hold money if it works in a way that preserves your purchasing uh, power over time. And Bitcoin does that. Um, and we know that when we zoom out, Bitcoin does that. Um, and dollars obviously is the opposite. And that's why you have a monetary premium on the stock market. You have a monetary premium put on housing, um, on real estate, all of these things that should just be sort of like all right, well, I want to invest in a company and here's sort of why it makes sense for me to do that. I want to buy a home to house my family and to be safe and secure um, without having that like additionally think about it as like, this is how I uh, maintain the value of my money. Um, and so Bitcoin offers a better uh, a better chance of doing that, I think. Mm. I mean, it's, it's sad as well because a lot of people will then go into the stock market and maybe lose money then because they don't have the expertise or like they get pulled on by the emotions. And then the same thing where is if you pay some fund manager as well, you're probably losing a decent cut of what you would be as well. Right. So then your right. only option is maybe just to go for an index fund, but then like even with that, there's certain issues and, and it all stems from the fact that you can't hold your money in cash. Right. And it's like, that is so eight. Like it doesn't, it's the simple truth, but it, it, when you really think about it, it doesn't make any sense at all. Well, it's 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 one of the three most important aspects of like what makes money good money, right? Is that it's a store of value, and if it, it's clearly like fiat money all around the world, like the the U.S. dollar might be like they say that it's the cleanest dirty shirt, but it's not good because over the next twenty years, I know dollars aren't going to hold their value. So if the if even over the next year, like yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure, right? So like you end up, you just end up doing other stuff with your money, and and that just 
instead of people realizing that means the money is broken and that's why I have to do these things, they just think, well, this is the way it is. And so hopefully like a lens of Bitcoin offers them an opportunity to understand like, oh, I can see now that the money is broken. And if we have a better monetary system, then other things are possible. And just to explore that and continue their education, I think is critically important. Uh, I want to kind of uh, take a little route to Bitcoin Miami, which I know you were at. And I'm just kind of curious, like, what was sort of the reaction, I guess, to kind of like your book, your ideas, what you were speaking about and all that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, So being in Miami was awesome. I mean, this was the first time I was able to go to the conference. Um, So I don't have like a basis of comparison. Uh, Obviously, this year, we're really in like the heart of the bear market. So it wasn't as like, sort of, uh, boisterous or as populated as last year. But um, my my feeling was it was a lot of fun. Uh, I got to meet a lot of Bitcoiners in real life and got to have lots of really meaningful exchanges with them and, and spend time with them. Um, you know, Bitcoiners as a general rule are very friendly and like awesome because you know that you have something to in common that you really wow. care about. So that was just great. I got to meet a ton of people. Um, and, you know, it was weird because, you know, like I'm, I'm beginning to be known in the space, but like, I'm not like super famous or anything. I, I just wrote this book. It came out a month ago. So, you know, sometimes I just be wandering around alone, like listening to a talk or like going to a different kiosk and trying to learn stuff. And other times people would come up to me and tell me like, Oh my God, like you wrote this book. I can't believe it. And it was just like a weird dichotomy where like half the time or most of the time I was being ignored. And then these bursts where people were like, Oh, I'm so excited to meet you. I can't believe it. Can I take your picture? It was just like this contrast between like that. And then like, Oh, like nobody knows who I am. <laughs> so it was like nice in the sense I got to wander around most of the time mm. and just sort of learn and connect with people and like really just have meaningful conversations. Um, but it, it's clear in those other moments that like the book speaks to people. The book has helped people. Um, they're excited to have it out there as a resource. Um, I've heard from like tons of people in Miami and otherwise, like I, I'm, I can't wait to get this book to my brother. I can't wait to like get, you know, try to orange pill this family member of mine or a friend of mine. And it just seems like a, a lot of the people buying the book are doing so because they have somebody in their life that they love and they care about um, and they want to orange pill that person. And, and they think that my book is going to be maybe the way to do that. So that makes me feel happy and proud because I think that's why I wrote the book is to have a resource for people who um, need to learn about Bitcoin and don't want to get turned off from the other stuff that's out there. So um, in Miami, I got to meet a lot of people who sort of confirmed that they viewed the book in the same way and um, they were excited to sort of explore it and to share it with, with other people. That's really rewarding. I mean, they're like the (laughs) knock on effects in a sense of like, when you think about it, like one person buys it, they give it to someone else. And it's true. Cause like, when I think about books to recommend someone, it's sometimes tricky. Cause like, obviously the the most popular, the Bitcoin standard, but then some people Mm -hmm. will not necessarily agree with some of the views um, which then safety will have and which then takes then the view of what he's then writing about. So to have something that, oh, I can actually just give this to my brother. Like he's not going to really have anything that he's going to react to this, like really negatively yeah. is super, super valuable. And obviously yeah. the compounding effects of this, like if you go out five years, it's pretty powerful. I hope so. Yeah. And I think, you know, obviously like the Bitcoin standard is a great resource if you want to learn about Bitcoin. It's it's actually not a great resource if you want to learn about Bitcoin and then you're a liberal person and you go and like look up Safedine because you're just going to be called names and like, you know, be told that like, well, if you believe in climate change, then you're an idiot and all this stuff. Right. So like it's a great resource, but it doesn't provide sort of the, the atmosphere where people are going to be comfortable learning. And I think that that's the key. Like my goal is to just make people comfortable learning about Bitcoin. And it, and my book is not for everybody. Like it's certainly like, like it speaks about Bitcoin from an angle that some people aren't going to agree with. Um, but I, I do think everybody who cares about Bitcoin has somebody in their life that this book will speak to. So I think that's the hope is like you say, the knock on effect. Like if you give the book to somebody, then they might learn about Bitcoin and be excited about it and then give the book to somebody else. And that's the All hope, right? right? That in five years from now, like uh, there's there's a community out there who understands Bitcoin from this angle and it really speaks to them. And you've launched in a bear market as well, which is um, a tricky thing too. And yeah. I'm sure when things kind of t- 
turn around, your book will be <laughs> shared a hell of a lot more than what it is now. I, yeah, I, I think that the timing of the book is important for me, right? Like I'm excited to have launched in a bear market, right? Because bear markets are about building things. But it's also like, you know, we're a year out from the having. We're a year out from the U.S. presidential election. We are, you know, in a bear market. So like the book is out there as an established resource for people. So like if they hear a presidential candidate, for example, talking about Bitcoin and they want to learn more, now there's a book that they can actually like look to to get more uh. information. Um, so I'm just excited about the timing. And, I, you know, me and the people at Bitcoin Magazine who published the book, like we all worked really hard to make sure that the book was ready in time and, and sort of like, as you say, like, um, the timing is good because when things take off or the presidential election heats up or whatever the case is, like the book is out there as a resource and, and people can use it, um, uh, hopefully to their benefit. Mm. We're coming up on your hour now and I don't want to keep you too long. Sure. So yeah. I'm going to ask the question that I know a lot of, <laughs> a lot of people hate, but what would your kind of your key takeaways to leave with the reader be? Aside from just read your book, which I will most certainly recommend people do, and uh, link down in the comment section. Yeah, so the takeaway for my readers, um, so yeah, obviously the, um, you know, the website for my book has um, a link to buy the book, but also like a lot of other resources. I think that the, the key takeaway for me is like, um, we all need to, if you believe in Bitcoin or you see its value, um, it's important that you just try to, educate people in a way that makes sense to them, right? Meet people where they are. Um, if you really care about that person, then you should be able to find a way that resonates with them. So it might not be my book, but you should probably think about, okay, I care about this person and here's what I think will resonate with them. So the key, the key for me to leave with people is to say, there's a ton of resources out there. Learning about Bitcoin is super important. You know, there's either you either learn about Bitcoin before you have to or you learn about it like when you have to. And hopefully people are learning about Bitcoin before they have to. Uh, um, and just to try to give people a resource or talk to them in a way that meets them where they are and helps them feel comfortable. I think that's the key. Um, and hopefully we just sort of everybody listening gets out there and tries to orange pill as many people as they can and do so and sort of like with enthusiasm and, and love in your heart and uh, everything else will work out. Uh. Awesome, man. I love that. Um, thank you so much for coming on and for your time and yeah. for, yeah, getting back to us. Really appreciate it. It's, um, it's great to, yeah, it's great to properly meet you. You seem like such a just nice, nice guy. Um, <laughs> and so yeah. I really appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate you having me on. I mean, it's a great talk and, you know, I, I enjoyed it, but I, I, you know, like, I think that, I've, I've seen some of the interviews you're doing and they're great. So you keep up the good work. And, and I, I just appreciate sort of the platform to talk about my project and, and appreciate that time. So thanks a lot, Jason. I yeah. hope you have a great rest of your day and thank you once again. Thanks. See you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.